weeks with that. So, and finish with that section by talking about some properties that integrals have. So this is basically just going to be a list, but some of these are quite important. I mean, I guess we'll start with maybe the most fundamental one. If f of x is continuous on, <laughs> sorry, if f of x is continuous on an interval, then the integral of f of x over that interval exists. I mean, that definition, the limit as n goes to infinity of the Riemann sum, it's maybe not entirely obvious but that limit does always exist. And I think that this becomes pretty clear if you just think of it geometrically. I mean, we have an interval, we have some curve and we draw the curve without lifting the marker from the page, well, the integral is just the weighted area. So we add up this positive area and we add up this negative area and we subtract the negative area from the positive area. I mean, why wouldn't that exist? The reason, I mean, you do have integrals that don't exist. This word here, this word continuous is important. Um, it's easy to create non-continuous functions where the integral doesn't exist but we're going to be working with continuous functions. And I can um, go a little further than that. If the function has finitely many jump discontinuities. Then the integral exists. And that's a fancy sounding name for a simple concept. Suppose that a function is continuous, except we reach a place and the function jumps. And then it's continuous until we reach some face and the function jumps. If we have a curve that looks like this, the integral exists. So these definite integrals do exist in general, even if that limit is pretty complicated looking. The remaining uh, few properties, let's see, going in order of importance. Maybe I shouldn't say that. I don't want 
don't want people to decide if stuff's not important. There is no need to memorize it, but you know that the next few conditions are important because they get their own name. They're collectively called linearity. And this can be a little confusing because this is unrelated, more or less, to linear functions. Linearity is two properties, actually. Suppose we have a definite integral of a constant times a function. Linearity says, okay, that constant just pulls right out of that definite integral. You might recall, by the way, hopefully, oh, my throat, hopefully you recall, this is a property that indefinite integrals have as well. So definite and indefinite integrals might look kind of unrelated at the moment, but they do have some properties in common. Property two as well. This is something that we stated for indefinite integrals, but it's also true for definite integrals. If you've got the definite integral of a sum or a difference, you can break that up into two definite integrals being added or subtracted. And of course, at the moment, these, these two properties don't look like much because we don't know how to find any definite integrals. So, um, so being able to say, okay, we can break a definite integral up isn't currently very valuable because it's like, well, fine, but we don't know how to find this definite integral. And now we have two definite integrals that we don't know how to find. That's not an improvement. But of course, we're not going to spend all of Calc 1 and Calc 2 not being able to find definite integrals. This is a temporary state of affairs. The next, uh, in terms of importance, the next property is a little more rare than you used, but suppose we have an integral from A to B, a definite integral of a function. So we've got the starting point and we've got an ending point and then Midway, or maybe not midway, but somewhere between A and B, we've got another value, C. Then this definite integral is the integral from A to C of f of x dx, plus the integral from C to B of f of x dx. And this, um, this is one of those things where once you see the geometry of it, it should be pretty clear. So say that's our curve. 
friend. We're looking at this integral. So this curve is positive. So the integral speaking geometrically is just the area under the curve. The integral from A to C, speaking geometrically, is the area of that region. And the integral from C to B, speaking geometrically, is the area of this region. So yeah, it's true that when you put together this left-hand region and this right-hand region, you are just left with the entire region. <laughs> I've called this um, a more specialized result compared to linearity, which gets used pretty frequently, and existence, which gets used all the time. Um, the most common place you would use this result is in this situation, where you have piecewise defined functions. You would say, okay, let's just break this function into pieces. Let's look at that first piece. Let's look at that second piece. Let's look at that third piece. And we would be taking an integral and we would be breaking it into three pieces in this case, using the result on the on that frame. So like if we have f of x equals x squared, when x is less than one, and uh, x plus one, when x is greater than or equal to one. Suppose we want the integral from zero to two of f of x dx. Well, what we could say is, okay, so this function is x squared from zero to one. And then from one to two, it's x plus one. So this integral is the integral from zero to one of x squared, plus the integral from one to two of x plus one. This rule is mainly used in this way. If we're trying to look at a piecewise defined function, we use this rule to break it into its pieces, as it were. Questions so far? Then. Come on, work with me. Then getting into the more situational uh, results. This is our result 
that has some applications in probability and statistics. It's not going to see a lot of use in our calculus class, but the integral from A to A of any function is zero. That is to say, if our left and endpoint and our right hand endpoint are the same, the integral is zero. And just trying to understand that geometrically, we have a function. We have, let me try that again. We have A here. I mean, geometrically, we're just taking the area under this curve, but, but we're only looking at a single point. So the area under the curve at A is just the area of that line segment. Um, two line segments are two-dimensional objects. They don't have areas, or rather their areas are zero. So this is really just a statement that the area of a line segment is zero. Finally, the integral from A to B of f of x dx, the way we have defined the integral and the way we've defined these Riemann sums, it makes it seem like A has to be less than B, right? I mean, the way we've defined these Riemann sums, we've had an integral from A to B, and A was the smaller number, and B was the bigger number. We're going to define the integral from B to A using this equality. The integral from A to B of a function is negative. The integral from B to A of a function. And we will see applications of this. In fact, we'll see applications of this this semester once we get into substitution techniques in the next, uh, that will be next week. Uh, by the way, I'll post an announcement. I think, the, I think that Sakai says we're going to have four tests. I don't think that makes a lot of sense with two weeks remaining. We'll just put all of this integral stuff on to the final exam. Um, moving on. So we will see applications of this. We may even see some applications today, you come to think of it. And, um, and those are the properties of the integral. I mean, and that is the end of this section, which is probably section 5.2, I want to say, 5.3 maybe. Um, but we're going to move right ahead in the section 5.2. Or, which I mean, since
maybe since we first defined um, the derivative is probably the, the most important section of the textbook or one of the most important sections of the textbook. This is called the fundamental theorem of calculus. And you see if the word fundamental was there, and that word is well chosen about half of what we're going to do in calculus two comes directly from this fundamental theorem. Having said that, Considering that it's one of the most important theorems in mathematics, textbooks are weirdly non-uniform about how this fundamental theorem is presented. The way our textbook presents it, and the way I'm going to present it, is that the fundamental theorem of calculus has two parts, a part one and a part two. If you're like going to other resources to get help with material, good, first of all, always like uh, encourage students to do that. But some resources might talk about the first fundamental theorem of calculus and the second fundamental theorem of calculus. And that's the same thing that we're doing. It's just that instead of saying we have two theorems, we say that we have one theorem, but it has two parts. Again, very weird and kind of unusual that such a major theorem should be presented in such a sort of piecemeal and non-uniform way. But it is what it is. So the first part of the fundamental theorem is going to require some background to make coherent. And the background it requires to, as I say, make coherent is that you can define a function using a definite integral in a very standard way. f of x equals the definite integral from some starting value Two acts of some function G of T B T. <laughs> so what this definition is doing, I mean, for example, F of X equals the integral from zero to x of t squared dt. F of zero, for example, is the integral from zero to zero of t squared dt as pretty much the only integral we know how to take 
the integral from a to a is always zero. None of these details matter. I mean, as long as this point and this point are the same, the integral is definitely zero. F of three, for example, it's the integral from zero to three of t squared dt. We do not, at this point in time, know how to take the integral from zero to three of t squared. But I mean, we understand what this is geometric. We've got the interval from zero to three, and we've got the function e squared and the integral from zero to three is the area of that region, whatever that area might be. This might seem like a very artificial way of defining a function, but it's relatively easy to come up with real world examples of this. And as sort of the simplest real world example, if an object has positive velocity, The area under the velocity curve is the distance the object travels. So let's look at this kind of function in this context. F of x equals the integral from zero to x of v of t and maybe we pick some number. Maybe, you no, know, you could ask, okay, what's f of two? It's the integral from zero to two of v of t dt. Notice that the variable x goes in here. We have a different variable on the right of the integral sign. Our variable is t. So replacing x with 2 isn't turning this v to v of 2. It remains v of t. Well, this is whatever our velocity curve is doing f of two is the area under the curve between zero and two seconds. So that's the distance the object travels in two 
seconds. And I selected that number two just as an illustration, but there's nothing magical about two. The, inter, um, the function capital F of X is giving you the distance the object travels after X second. And let's get those separated. So this function, I mean, when you first see a function defined that way, I think your instinct, certainly my instinct as a student, was that this is a very artificial and very uninteresting way of defining a function. But it's, as we see, it's relatively easy to come up with real world functions defined in this way. Yeah, I mean, this example is slightly banal. You'll see more interesting examples if you take any kind of calculus-based probability and statistics course. The, um, functions like this show up all the time in that application. We actually will see that briefly in calculus too. Well, once we've convinced ourselves that this is not just a big waste of time and that functions like this can appear in real world applications, what have we spent uh, what have we spent this entire class practically doing? We've spent uh, the majority of this class at least studying derivatives. So if we have this function f of x, it makes perfect sense to ask, what's the derivative of this function? What's, I probably don't, I've been using capital F and lowercase f for a function and its antiderivative. So to be clear, that could be any function g of t there. I don't mean that there's that relationship between them. So what is the derivative of capital F of X? The first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. The derivative of this function is g of x. So the derivative and the integral are kind of inverses of one another. Um, differentiating this function gets rid of the integral sign. So for example, I think we saw 
f of x equals the integral from zero to x of t squared dt. The first part of the fundamental theorem of Kaup to this says that the derivative of capital F of X is X squared. So two observations. Um, the derivative F prime of X is a function of X. So from t squared, we have x squared. That's my first observation, I guess. My second observation, or rather a question, what's that lower limit of integration doing? And the answer to that question is that the lower limit of integration isn't affecting the derivative at all. If I erase that zero and put in a three, this derivative would still be x squared. So, I mean, that's the first part of the fundamental theorem. Let's just play around with it a little. Let's look at some slightly off mean to undo was trying to. Let's look at some variations. What if for whatever reason, you have this function where your variable x is down at the bottom instead of up at the top. Well, this is just going to provide us a quick application of this rule here, that we can switch the lower and upper limits of integration, and doing so just gives us a negative sign. So, where am I? This is negative the integral from a four to X of two T theta. And if we want the derivative, so remember that having a negative sign is the same as having a negative one. When we take the derivative, that negative is going to stick around. And we're going to get negative two x as our derivative. Does anybody, I should have asked before I did complications about the non-complicated example, does anybody have any questions at this point about the first part of the fundamental theorem of count to this? Then let's mess around a little more. What if f of x is the integral from one to x squared of two t? B, 
Um, this is a chain rule problem. It's a pretty ugly chain rule problem, or that's not quite true. It's just a chain rule problem of a sort that we're not used to doing. I mean, we've seen the sign of a function many times. We've seen a function raised to a power many times. This is new to us. See, and the easiest way to do this might be to think of um, this x squared as being a new variable. It might make the most sense to say that u equals x squared. Where? And what would that accomplish? Well, now X is a function of U and F is a function wrote that in the wrong order. Let me try that again. U is a function of X. U is X squared. F is a function of U. I mean, if we let U be X squared, it's this U up here that's controlling everything. So the chain rule says that DF DX is DF DU times DU dx. We haven't used the chain rule in this way in some time, but um, we did state this. This is how the chain rule is written when you're using Leibniz notation. Come on, what are we doing? Zoom. So DF DU. The first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says that if we're integrating from one to U and we take the derivative with respect to this variable, the derivative and the integral eliminate each other, and we get whatever this function is. In this case, 2u. du dx is 2x. So that's 4 times u times x. U is X squared. So four times X squared times X, X squared times X is X cubed. And the little trick that we did here, as it were, I mean, we said, okay, we have X squared. We don't really know what to do if we have a function up here. Let's get rid of that function.
function. Let's say that x squared is u, and let's write u here, so that we now have this situation. Um, this is a trick that shows up a lot in our calculus. We're going to first see it, oh, this either Thursday this week or starting next week. And then we're going to really drill down into it in the last week of class. But it's, uh, it's something we're going to see a lot of. 8.45, slightly early, but we'll, I mean, this is such a natural place to call it with the first fundamental, with the first part done, we can do the second part tomorrow. Very clean.